After Jack Lehman stepped down in the spring of 1979, athletic director Frank McInerney promoted longtime assistant Ray Wilson, the former high school coach of Julius Irving, to become the next head coach. But after compiling a record of 5-48 and 48 in two seasons, Wilson's tenure ended quickly, and the program, which had enjoyed over a decade of success under Lehman, now appeared on life support. Coach Lehman, his last year, things began to really turn down. UMass had a period of time there where they lost 29 straight games, made a run at the longest losing streak in Division I basketball history. A reporter once wrote, the reason the UMass is called the Minutemen is because the games are over in a minute. I kind of gave up on how UMass was doing because, you know, they went through that whole season where they didn't even win a Division I game. And it just, it just wasn't worth my time. A Notre Dame assistant and former UMass player, Tom McLaughlin, took over in 1981, but things did not get much better. We beat Harvard at Harvard. And the reporter comes up to me and he said, what does it feel like to have your first win on the road in a couple of years? For the re and I said, what? I said, I didn't know that when I took the job. There were some changes that were made. The way the program was perceived, the investments that were made, um, and we, UMass did not kind of keep up with the time. The McLaughlin teams featured a talented trio of Edwin Green, Donald Russell, and Horace Naismith, each of whom finished in the top four on the program's all-time scoring list. Edwin Green was so good on these awful teams, he was the, at the time we were called the Eastern Eight, he was the Eastern Eight Rookie of the Year. He could have played on any one of these great teams that we had in the 80s and 90s, he was that good. Horace A. Smith was an undersized forward that played with his heart and played hard every game and uh, had some ability. Donald Russell was a great kid. He was from Mount Vernon, New York, a left-hander. He scored a lot of points. The hard part was you needed 10 of those players. And what you'd do is you'd end up with one or two or three, and it was very difficult at times to compete. McLaughlin's time as coach finished after two seasons in the spring of 1983, and Ron Gerlifson became the third coach of the young decade. Things did pick up some. In the new coach's first campaign, the Minutemen won double-digit games for the first time in five seasons. UMass hovered below the 500 mark for most of Gerlifson's tenure, thanks in large to talented point guard Carl Smith and sharpshooting Lorenzo Sutton. Lorenzo Sutton was certainly a, a tremendous, tremendous talent. He was someone who came very close to an NBA career. Shooting guard from uh, Albany, Georgia. Um, wound up becoming, at the time, the all-time leading scorer in UMass history with over 1,700 points. After failing to record a winning record in any of his five seasons, Gerlifson resigned in the spring of 1988. After an extensive search, Pittsburgh assistant coach John Calipari was hired to replace Gerlifson and was charged with bringing the program back to the winning ways of the 70s. Temple was number one in the country in 87 or 86. So you were in a league that obviously you could get your program to be number one in the country. But on the outside, when you looked at it, it had been bad for a long time. It was a program in need of a lot of help in a lot of areas. They'd had 11 consecutive losing seasons between 1978-79 and 88-89, which was John Calipari's first season. Coach Cal immediately convinced Jim McCoy, a highly touted prospect he had been recruiting at Pitt, to follow him to Amherst and sign with UMass. The only way I knew about UMass basketball was through Cal because Cal was the assistant coach at Pitt. So I was going to go to Pitt, and then when he got the job at UMass, then I decided to go to school up to UMass. Never saw the school. An outstanding scorer, could hit the open shot, 6'4", uh, forward guard, whatever you, wherever you wanted to play, he could score. Just knowing Cal from high school, I knew that once he got the program started, that you know big things were going to happen. So. We, we knew the first couple years were going to be rough, and I was ready to leave after probably the first day. Without a winning season in the entire decade of the 80s, the Minutemen seemed far from serious contention heading into the 1990s. Well, we were 10 and 18 our first year. None of us were smart enough to know we weren't supposed to get this thing going. We didn't think in those terms. We didn't know that, you know, it can't be done here. And, and I think we approached it as though, let's just go make this happen. Coming into the 90s, there hadn't been any reason to think that would turn around, certainly not dramatically, uh, but we were wrong. 